are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Happy Sabbath everyone. God is good and all the time. In all honesty, how many of you love God? Can I see your hand? Uh, God bless you. God bless you. God is happy. We're always told that wives and girlfriends love to be told, I love you. Well, God loves to be told, I love you. Not so much verbally as behaviorally. And so thank you for loving my God and your God. Where are our guests? You are not the Seventh-day Adventists but you are with us, just raise your hands. We will not embarrass you, God bless you. Where are the other hands? There were so many hands yesterday. Where are your hands? Just raise, God bless you, God bless you. God bless you, God bless you. Anybody else? Anywhere, did I miss a hand? God bless you, you finally made up your mind that you're a guest, okay. Good to have you. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let me offer a prayer for our guests. Our Father, thank you for your spirit that led these guests to join us. I ask you now, Father, because you know everything within and without, grant to each of them a blessing that fits their needs and exceeds their needs. Above all, grant them the blessing of a closeness to the Savior and let this experience in their lives lead them to seek further association with us in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. How are you? How are you? So am I. I didn't sleep much last night, so you need to pray and ask God to sustain me. I don't want to be sleeping while I am preaching. So you say, Father, please sustain that sleepy-looking preacher. I don't know what happened last night, but I just slept very little, perhaps constantly thinking of what to say to you, how to say it, and what to say at the main service and whenever else I speak. That kind of mental activity can keep you awake. But the Lord has a way of renewing our strength. Are we online, yes or no? I didn't hear you. Oh, we are. Well, let me greet the audience online, wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining us. We believe the Lord will bless you as super abundantly as he blesses us in this building our subject for this morning cross-cultural competence what did i say cross-cultural competence before i get into that let me remind you of the three favors i usually ask favor number one if you're not using one of these gizmos turn it off completely if you're using it turn the sound all the way down favor number two while i'm speaking pray for me and say lord Put your words in that man's mouth. That request is based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, which says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And as surely as God lives, I want to speak God's words. And favor number three, it should appeal to you immediately as students and scholars think. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. It is a high honor to have God invite you and me to reason with him. He will listen to you. And so God will say, my daughter, my son, why have you stopped coming to church? Let's reason together. My daughter, my son, why are you always fighting with your parents? Let's reason together. My daughter, my son, why are you failing your classes? Let's discuss it, says God. God is a nice person. Let me give you my testimony about God. It's very short. God has never done anything wrong in my life. Never. All my blessings have come from God. All my problems I have brought on myself. Let me say it again. God has never done me anything wrong. All my blessings 
have come from God. All my problems I have brought on myself. And so I thank my father publicly for his consistent goodness to me. That's why I am alive today. What's our subject? Cross-cultural competence. Let's pray. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. There's no other way. I come in the name of the one who said, I and my father are one. I come in the name of the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. I come in the name of the one who said, which of you convinceth me of sin? In the sinless, divine name of Jesus, I come. And I ask you, Father, if I have offended you, forgive me. You're not a God who holds grudges the way we do. Forgive and forget. I stand at this desk to represent you and to be a blessing to those for whom your son shed his blood. Please, God, as an act of mercy, possess my mind. The same way people in the New Testament were demon-possessed, I want to be Holy Ghost-possessed now. Let it be your spirit speaking through me. I surrender myself completely. Bless everyone in the, within the sound of my voice. Bless those online. And a very special blessing on our guests. Now, Father, bless Zimbabwe, the host country. Guide the deliberations of the leaders. Remind them, dear God, that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men. And do the same for every other country represented by this audience in person and online. Touch the sick and give us a comprehension regarding this message. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Cross-cultural competence. Let's take a look at Exodus chapter 4. We read from verse 10. I read from the King James Version of the Bible. Exodus 4, reading from verse 10. Book number 2. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. God had called Moses in chapter 3 to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses makes an excuse. I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Go to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah 1, we'll read from verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, O oh Lord, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I'm a child. Jeremiah makes an excuse. Then the Lord said unto me, say not, I'm a child. God told him, do not say you're a child. Do not make excuses to me. When Moses said, I am slow of speech, God said in verse 11 of Exodus 4, who hath made man's mouth? Whatever excuse you have, says God, I have a response for it. In other words, we ought not to bring excuses to God. Now, why am I beginning this way? There is a common excuse that I have found, you perhaps have found, among people of all ages. They blame their lack of success perhaps on the color of their skin. They blame the lack of success perhaps on the fact that they're from this tribe or that tribe while another tribe is in the ascendancy. They blame their lack of success on perhaps the environment from which they came. I want you to listen carefully to cross-cultural competency. Go to Genesis 39. We'll read from verse 1. And I hope when this message is over, you will separate yourselves 
from excuses. Genesis 39, reading from verse 1, our subject, cross-cultural competence. It is 24 minutes after 8. I have to be done by 9, and I will do that. Do you have Genesis 39? Reading from verse 1, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. We're told three times in Genesis 39 that the master was an Egyptian. Clearly, the writer of Genesis, Moses, wants to create a distinction between the Hebrew Joseph and the Egyptian Potiphar. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Verse 3, and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Let me pause and I, no, well, yes, let me pause. How much did God make to prosper that Joseph did? Everything. What was the nationality of the household for which Joseph worked? Egyptian. What was Joseph's nationality? Hebrew. What was his status? Slave. Wrong nationality, bottom of the barrel status, non-Egyptian and a slave. Verse 3, and his master saw. The unbeliever saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Now, any business person has one object in mind. What's that? Profit. Success. And success is colorless. Excellence has no ethnic variations. His master saw that the Lord was with him. Question for you, do not answer me. Do your unbelieving friends see that the Lord is with you? If they don't see it, there's nothing wrong with their eyes. There's something wrong with your witness. The witness of a child of God ought to be so powerful and so sharp that the unbeliever who does not know God recognizes a superior power working in the life of that person. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Verse 4, and Joseph served him and, and he found grace in his sight and he served him. And he made him overseer of his house. And all that he had, he put into his hand. Question for you. Do you not believe that Potiphar had many Egyptian servants? Yes. But this one servant, Joseph, from the wrong nationality, he demonstrated capacities and capabilities that impressed Potiphar and Potiphar put him contrary to social expectations above his own countrymen. You know why? Verse 2, and the Lord was with Joseph. Verse 3, and his master saw that the Lord was with him and all that he had he put into his hand. Verse 5, and it came to pass from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptians for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not what he had save the bread which he did eat. Let's look at that microscopic. It is a cross-cultural Competence, excellence. 
an excellent spirit was found in Daniel. And Darius recognized it. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Pause. Microscopic reading of that verse again. Concentrate, please. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. They examined his professional work, looking for fault, a flaw, a weakness to condemn him before Darius. But they could find none occasion nor fault. Why? For as much as he was faithful. Faithfulness is cross-cultural. There are no ethnic variations of faithfulness and hard work. Daniel was faithful. And when these government officials examined his work, they could, find not, could not find one fault. And the verse ends, neither was any error or fault found in him. And so his excellence was professional. His excellence was personal. At both levels, they could find nothing. Let's go to verse 19 of Daniel 6, our subject, cross-cultural competence. We know the story. Daniel is thrown into the lion's den. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Darius had observed Daniel served God continually. Potiphar observed that Joseph had a close relationship with his God. Is thy God whom thou servest continually for the Christian, the foundation stone of excellence is a relationship with God. Somebody say amen. amen. Darius realized that. Then said Daniel unto the king, verse 21, O king, live forever. Now read verse 22 with me. My God hath sent his angel and hath done what? Shut, come on, the lion's mouth, that they have not hurt me. Why? Read the rest of the verse. For as much as before him, come on, innocency was found in me. I am innocent before God. Keep reading. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. I am innocent before God, the ruler of the universe, and before you, the ruler of the mightiest nation on earth. I am innocent before heaven and earth. Cross-cultural competence. Competence is also cross-galaxy, if I can create an expression. Daniel stood before God, and he was innocent of any wrongdoing. Daniel stood before Darius. He was innocent of any wrongdoing. This is the highest level of excellence. And it's cross-cultural. Let us see this in the life of the highest human being who ever lived, Jesus Christ. Go with me to Luke chapter 2. We'll read verse 52. Our subject, cross-cultural competence. Luke chapter 2, reading verse 52. Luke is gospel number 3. He was not one of the 12 disciples. He was the best ancient historian. I say that again. Luke was the finest ancient historian you have Luke 252 speaking of Jesus Christ the Bible says and that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man the standard can be no different for you your excellence must impress 
God and man. Because excellence is not only cross-cultural, it is cross, as I said earlier, galaxy. Excellence, as I said yesterday, is morality. What do I mean? Let me say it differently. Mediocrity is immorality. Excellence is an expression of moral uprightness. Because incompetence has a negative effect on those who observe. If you're attending a college, University of Zimbabwe, and you're lazy, you seldom attend classes, someone may see you and be influenced by that and thereby destroy that person's life. Mediocrity is immorality. Excellence is a high expression of morality. Joseph had it. Daniel had it. The three Hebrew boys had it. You can have it. God requires it of you. Let me explain what I mean. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Keeping God's commandments is the whole duty of man. There is one level of keeping the commandments that God accepts, and that is perfect obedience. Why is that? Because Psalm 19 verse 7 informs us the law of the Lord is perfect. Anything less than that falls short of the standard in God's law. But God's law is the whole duty of man. What am I saying? God requires of us a level of excellence that is flawless. Some things, when anything God says, not something, must be accepted by faith. Because often they sound impossible. You know, Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty four, if you shall say to this mountain, be moved and be cast to the sea and shall not doubt, the mountain will move. When Peter walked on the water and he began to sink, he said, Lord, save me. The Bible says, immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Why did you doubt? Why are you doubting? Because doubt has no benefits with respect to doubting the standards God has set. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 4. We might be partakers of the divine nature. You and I cannot be God, but we can be extremely God-like or godly. And anyone God-like is excellent in every area of life. Because excellence is godly behavior. As I said yesterday... When your God, your creator, ended his work, he saw everything he had made and behold, it was very good. And you're made in his image, he requires the same of you and me. Excellence, my dear friends, is a cross-cultural competence. Your lack of success has nothing to do with your color if you are connected to God. Let me point out something you might have missed. Go back quickly to Genesis 39. We read verses 2 and 3. Genesis 39, 2 and 3. My thanks to whomever set up this uh, cooling system. Genesis 39, 2 and 3. Listen carefully. The Bible is the voice of God speaking. Here's what the Bible says. And the Lord was with Joseph... And he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now, read verse 3 microscopically. And his master saw, and we dealt with that, that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord, finish the verse, made all that he did. To, which means 
God assumes responsibility for the results in your life. You didn't say amen, perhaps because you're thinking. That's my conclusion. Look at verse 3, if it's up there. God made what Joseph did prosper. Why? Because Joseph and God had a partnership. And whenever God and the human being has a partnership, God is the senior partner. And you and I work not only with him, but for him. Joseph's business essentially was God's business and God knows how to take care of his business. And so all that Joseph did, God bless. Clearly, we must conclude every time Joseph undertook a project, the glory of God was his primary concern. That's why everything he did, God bless. God blesses nothing not committed to his glory. Let me ask you this. Excellence isn't just writing an excellent scientific paper on the cardioprotective effects of vitamin C. Mm -mm. Excellence is also how you think. Is God in charge of your education? Is God in charge of your business? Is God in charge of your family? Whatever God is in charge of works very well. And so his master saw that the Lord was with him. Is God in charge of your romantic relationship? If he is, he will look at it and he will say, and God saw everything that he had made in that relationship, that classroom, that family, that business. And behold, finish it, very good. Come ye blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for those who lived excellent lives. If there's someone listening to me, you have practiced and mastered the art of incompetence and mediocrity, you ought to repent to God right where you are. I will not ask for raising of hands. You ought to repent to God for practicing mediocrity with the mind God has given you to exercise excellence. Now let me ask you generally, how many of you will say, Father, having heard what I just heard, I recommit my life to you to live it excellently in every area that the glory may come to you and a blessing to me. How many will commit their lives to excellence right now? Can I see your hand? And I want you to be serious. Stand up with me quickly. The commitment is, Father, I commit my life to excellence. An excellence led by God himself. Excellence is not something you do. Excellence is something you are. Let me say differently, excellence first and foremost is a state of mind. So if someone tells you, hand me this microphone, you do it excellently. Why? Because birds fly, fish swim, I perform excellently. I am, I am genetically wired to do everything well. Why? Because I've been born again and in the image of God. Are you failing your classes? Don't look at the syllabus or the incompetence of the teacher. Look at you. Is your business failing? Don't look at the governmental policies. Look at your relationship between you and God. Is your family crumbling? Don't look at the church members. Look at your relationship with God. Are there stresses in that romantic relationship? Don't look at the girl or the boy or the woman or the man. Look at the individual relationship with God because anything that God controls works out. Can you say amen? Anything God controls works out. When I say control, I don't mean against your will. Joseph chose to work with God. Daniel chose to work with God. Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, they chose to work, with, to work with God. And ultimately, Jesus chose 
to work with his father. And all of them demonstrated excellence. My brothers and sisters, if all Adventist students were at the top of the class in every school, many more students may want to be Seventh-day Adventists. If all Adventist businesses were flourishing, many more people may want to be Seventh-day Adventists. If all Seventh-day Adventist families were strong, many more people may want to be Seventh-day Adventists. If all Adventists were healthy and robust, many more people may want to be Adventists, not because of a sermon, but because of a lifestyle. And so you stood to say, Father, I commit myself to excellence in everything I do. And the foundation stone for that is the surrender of the life to God so that He controls your life and you cooperate with Him to say it differently, God has the will and you sit in the passenger seat with one hand on God's hand. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for those who listened and listened closely. Thank you, God, for the examples in the scriptures of Daniel, Joseph, the three Hebrew boys, ultimately that human being, Jesus Christ himself. And while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, Father, I'll make a tough appeal. If there's someone listening to me, you have not made a conscious effort to reach excellence in your studies, your life, your work. You have not made a conscious effort to be excellent in your life, your studies, your work. And you want to say now, Father, grant me that wisdom, grant me that grace, that from this point forth, my desire, my ambition will be to demonstrate that excellence in all I do. If that applies to you, don't move, just raise your hand, let me see. It's a courageous call. Father, I have not been demonstrating excellence in my life. From this point on, dear God, I want that chain. God of heaven and earth, look at the hands just raised. And in the name of the excellent Jesus Christ, infuse them, dear God. Inject into them that serum of excellence, that mindset that is never satisfied with anything less than the best. Bless us all and help us to understand, dear God, that preaching isn't the only way to bring people to Christ. Lifestyle speaks more powerfully than a sermon. Let every one of us be a sermon by lifestyle, a lifestyle of excellence. And Father, when you come into your kingdom, your excellent kingdom, save us, dear God, where we will live an excellent life for all eternity. We thank you that competence is not culturally bound. It is cross-cultural for the man or the woman who gives the life to Christ. Hear this humble prayer. Bless us for the remainder of the day, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. God bless you.